Now, if, so therefore, if you take a round, any round, it is even, it's even more. If you take the building downtown, famously known as the GM building now, uh, initially known as the Renaissance building, those, are, those buildings are built in rounds. Here. Here's the core. These are rounds. Core and rounds. Now this is a building that really doesn't work. Now they built this building. It was originally planned to be built for $150 million. That was John Portman's uh, estimate. By the time they started to raise money, because they got 51 companies to go into it, we wouldn't go into it and as a partner, but they got 51 companies to go into it. Basically, I'm really trying to help Detroit. And, uh, and you can hurt a city by building a bad building, not help it. It's a reverse. Now, what happened, he couldn't get all the elevators in here. So he had to build these pimples on the outside. <laughs> now, this is office space. These are hotel rooms. This is, a, this is the space revolving cocktail lounge. Now, it really doesn't work for anything. Because number one, you don't build an office with all equal spaces. This was the brochure, part of the brochure. It's just not, People want, need different spaces for different uses. And they want to be expand spaces. So you can't, you can't take this space and, and say that works. It doesn't work. If you're ever in one of these offices, you'll realize it doesn't work. Number one, again, they lose the space here. As you can see. This, this incidentally was preliminary. This was never built, fortunately. Build a couple of buildings out here. But. Now this is the interior. Uh, we were familiar with this building because um, Mr. Ford asked me to do the retail on it, and he they oops and they sent a set of plans out to me, and I looked at the plans, and I said, well, where's the retail? So they sent another set out, and they had taken a yellow pencil and filled in the retail. I said, well, how did you get to it? When you build this kind of a space, okay, here's the rounds. And this is the big round where the hotel is. These are the, the basically the rounds go in this thing for the office buildings. Now, so it didn't work. They had a hard time. They'd used it themselves. They put Philco uh, uh, Philco uh, uh, radio in there because Ford owned Philco radio at the time and they put them in there and they were very unhappy there and they finally sold the company and got out so that's the history of it because what was the, uh, cost? What was the cost of the building initially? Uh, oh initially it was one they raised the, the estimate from 150 to 180 that was when they just started to, I drove by that with Mr. Ford and I said, Henry, fill up the hole. <laughs> Forget it. I said, uh, it was a, it was really, it ran $300, $348 million ultimately is what they put into this. And these partners were very unhappy. They had to double how much money they came up with and they financed the balance. And ultimately they sold it to General Motors for $75 million. And General Motors really thought they had a big bargain. <laughs> they ended up putting almost 300 million more in it to, to try to make it usable for them. So it just shows you this was a, it was a disaster in planning. It was a disaster in thought. And it doesn't, didn't function. The retail really didn't function. I laid out the space by putting in a new system there. Uh, where they where it exists today, where you have a, a, a system that runs, but the elevator distances were too narrow, and people had to go through these to get around because these are four towers. It's too bad this thing was built in the middle of our cities. It, it, 
It, uh, it's not necessarily beautiful. It doesn't, even today after they put in all these glass walks and all this stuff, it still doesn't really work. And it's obvious John Portman. Pardon? It's obvious John Portman, Portman never read Gordon Cullen. He never read it. <laughs> he never read it. You right. can't have serial vision if you're just going around in a circle. Yeah, that's true. It's true. Anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm sorry to, to, you know, to talk about it that way because it is a community building today part of our community, but uh, it was, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lesson that everybody has to learn, that uh, if a doctor kills a patient, he hasn't really earned his fee, right? And that's basically what John Portman did. And he built three or four of these things, unfortunately. This wasn't enough, but he was a developer and an architect. And he built uh, one in Atlanta, he built one in Los Angeles, he built one in, uh, I forgot, fourth place. Anyway. Well, Detroit. Detroit, yeah. In San Francisco, yeah. Pardon? San Francisco. In San Francisco, you're right. He built four of these. And none of them, well, San Francisco is a little different, but uh, it's not really four towers like this. But uh, anyway, so uh, now this is, uh, this is this building that KPF, uh, uh, Gene Cohn told us about, uh, that he had built in, in uh, Canary Wharf. And we thought I would, we would discuss it from our standpoint. Now this is a, a different kind of building. It's a building uh, to be used for trading. This, these are trading floors. And this is a huge, huge level, 36,000 feet. It is really a huge space, 258 feet long and 140 feet wide or something, 154 feet wide. That's a huge building. It's 36,000 feet net after the notches come out. And here's the building. Have you been, have any of you been to Canary Wharf? You haven't. Well, a long time, long time. You have, uh, it's, it was a place called the Dogs, Dodges, Dog. I forgot, it was a place called, it had an awful name originally. And, uh, and uh, it was built by a can Canadian developer, very talented man who built a lot of buildings in New York. He was from uh, Montreal and he, uh, he, and there was a need for office space in London. And, the, and what happens is when you have this big need, it's gonna be met even though the zoning didn't allow it to happen within what they call the city. They were remodeling buildings internally and trying to make them work, but they wouldn't allow really any building to be built because they wanted to keep the tone of the city, which was great in thought, but the city had to grow or it would die because it became, it was uh, the future uh, banking center of, of Europe. And so, they built this, uh, this is one of the trading, uh, trading floors where they need big space. They have a lot of people. And people have these, have a computer or a set of computers and they have a sort of a, it's not a closed office, it's all open. But on the other hand, uh, these are done on a, on a closed basis, which is interesting. These are these booths. And these are community uh, rooms, uh, meeting rooms, me large meeting rooms. But this is uh, it's an unusual thing to have 36,000 foot floor. And this was, there were 40 floors this way. So of trading, some of them at the top, you got the wrong, oh, you got the, you changed pictures on me here. Uh, Show me that elevation. Yeah, here. You can see these floors go up to about here and then break back. But generally, this is a very large floor for development. Yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. Anyway, coming back to this. When you, this, this, this is two circles basically. 
when you think of it in development. It's two circles. And as I mentioned before, a circle is a very difficult thing to lay out space in. Because desks and chair, everything is square, rectangular or square. And rectangles don't fit in the rounds. That's the basic thing. People that build round bedrooms, as an example, need round beds. Because <laughs> the straight bed won't fit in it. You ever try to sleep in a round bed? Anyway, <laughs> you got, you, if you got this space, again, you're dealing in pies. You see, you deal in pies, that's what you deal. It's like you take a pizza and you, and, you, and you cut up the pizza and you end up with pies. Now, if this is, say, hotel rooms, as an example, what happens is in a hotel room, you have the front space and then you have back space, the space that's somewhat used, the corridor, closet, bathroom. Now, if you come, the cheapest space is back here. You rob yourself of that space. That's why it's inefficient. You pay for the space back here because you remember, the space out here is what you're paying for. You're paying for this. You give this back. And that space translates its space into here. If you do it mathematically, you'll find that's the way it works. And, and that's using straights, not, that's using planes, not curved glass I'm talking about. I'm talking about doing this, not, uh, not getting now. This is interesting. I didn't want to comment at that. This is 33 Wacker Drive, which Gene Cohn proposed here. It's beautiful to look at. And there was a justification for this because the river turns, remember? He said the river turns, so he built this building. Now, this ends up with two problems. Number one, to try to make the curve work, but also they got points here. The minute you get down below 60 degrees, buildings are not efficient because you can't fit anything in it. I hate to mention this, but <laughs> this building I built over here, I didn't build, I paid for over here, paid for, uh, they put my name on it over here, across, across here. When, uh, when they designed this building, when they brought this building to me and see if I wanted to invest in it, which I agreed to, uh, I only commented on one thing, and that was the point. You couldn't, have, you couldn't have washed the windows in there. You couldn't have gotten into there. <laughs> Lewis is laughing. You couldn't have gotten into there because basically there wasn't enough room. You'd have to get a guy about this bag <laughs> who could have gotten in there and washed the windows. So they opened it up. But it still doesn't work. You can't put anything in it. Now it's good, it's, it's a design element and I'm not arguing with it in terms of as a design. But the use of space is the first thing that an architect must learn, how space can be used. If he's building space, and how space, that he must identify that space in terms of use and make it work. And Michael Graves builds wonderful buildings. I love his work. But basically, these tops he puts on are interesting. When I ask him at that meeting as to Michael, what do you have in there? He says air. And money. Huh? And, money. and money. That's not, it's not, it's not inexpensive. Now, it makes the building very interesting. I like his architecture. And I'm sure, but he, he does a lot of municipal things. He doesn't work for a lot of developers. Anyway, so this point is worthless. 
You can't put a desk in there. You can't put a person in there. That's what you have to watch. That's all I want to, I want to identify this, not as a mistake, it's a beautiful building. And, but I want to, the, but the way this works, this, this is a very expensive way to build. It's very, very expensive. This is a very tall building, <coughs> over 40 stories. And, uh, and as you get very tall, as you go up in a building, the cost increases. Because the speed of your elevators have to go up, you're pumping everything. And don't forget it, as you go vertical, costs multiply as you go up. The further you go up, the more it multiplies. Now, your land stays consistent. It depends on what you paid for your land. You gain there, you gain on foundations. Because if you're building, if you're building caissons or piling, you're going to the rock, the rock, and you only have to go to rock once, it'll carry anything. But the point is, is that as you do this, you give up things, but you gain things. You gain rent, obviously. You gain height, remember height was important in terms of view ambiance. You gain these things, but you have to think. Yes, sir? Is there a formula that you use to figure out if you get a piece of land, what the optimal height would be? If, yes. You know. The formula, number one, is the client. Number two, number two is the use. Number three is the location. Number four is the market. Now the market ultimately is what, what makes you go taller. If the market is there, then you go taller. If the market isn't there, maybe you shouldn't even be building it. That's the, that's the question. That's what you gotta think about. Use, market, and the client. All right, now, dysfunctional. <laughs> Now, building cost efficiency, design determined by use. There, there are, you should, when you go into an examined space, you should think about many kinds of grids that you can use. And your engineers, you should work with your engineers because ultimately they can help you create the lightest structure that you can afford at the, best, at the best spans. Now as an example, if you, have, if you have parking below, I'm just giving you a, a below your building, which isn't a good idea if you can help it. But if that's the only thing you can do and you need parking on this site, you have to go below. You have to think then as to what the centers of those columns, because you have to continue those down. If you try to do a transfer beam, it's incredibly expensive and then it's you have problems in terms of, of, uh, of uh, uh, sinkage and all these problems that you run into. But, uh, so, that's part of grids. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Thoman, you, you just said that, that you should not do underground parking unless you, you really need to. If in Europe, most buildings have underground parking. Can you explain why do you think it's not a good idea? Uh, you, just, you just said that uh, well, you should avoid underground parking, but in Europe, most buildings have underground parking. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's a point, but you don't find any big garages. We're doing a project in Salt Lake City, as an example, where we have 5,000 cars below grade. 5,000 cars. And that's a very, very expensive process. Those cars probably cost $40,000 a car. If it were on grade, it might be 3,000 a car. If it were deck above grade, it could be 10 to 15 thousand dollars a car. But when you go below grade, you have water pressures, you have you have uh, uh, special sprinkling, you have ventilation. You have to ventilate. Very expensive to ventilate, and you're building a structure below grade. Are you saying that in Europe uh, the garages are smaller? 
then, and so they're... Well, basically, buildings are smaller, and, and uh, the parking needs are smaller. It's different. It's different, uh, you know. We've, I've built buildings there, and I know it's, uh, it's different. Uh, different use, different need, different size cars, generally. Yeah, you design for smaller cars there too. It's so you can get more, more car. We we design for about 110 cars as an open lot, 110 cars per acre roughly. Uh, there they do about uh, they do about 130 cars per acre. It's a difference. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyway, so uh, cost-effective structure. That's what we're talking about. And it's a combination of both. The wider, the wider you make the, 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 uh, the column spacing, the more depth you have. So therefore, that not only costs you in terms of the steel, but in addition, addition, you're building more exterior wall. Remember what I said before? Exterior wall is the most expensive thing in a building. So. As you do that, as you create that height difference, you actually end up with a more, more wall. So those are the considerations. But any grid that works mathematically and works in terms of loads is fine. You know. uh, impact of space planning, modules. You want to speak on that? <laughs> we threw that one in on sounds, sounds like, sounds like Ron is I'll get a drink. Yeah. Yeah. That was basically to say that if your use is residential and in your uh, size of your units are a certain size, then that's going to impact what your spacing on your grid is versus office versus any other use hospital. And so that the message here is you really need to understand the use to determine that grid. And so the grid helps you in not only in structures but in proper placement so that you don't have columns uh, in a non-sequential uh, placement where it would be in the middle of a residential unit, for instance. So you need to understand those modules, what the developer's preference is for the size of the unit, and then you determine the grid. And then as Professor Taubman said, if you have parking below grade and below the building or if you have stacked uses, you really have to design from the ground up because all those buildings find their way down. And it starts with a, a 30 by 60 is the, the best parking model that you can design too, because it's so efficient, but it's very expensive. But it's very convenient from a parking. Uh, that's, a 90, that's a 90 yeah, grid. 90 degree grid. 90 degree okay. grid. We'll show you that in a minute. Uh, so 60. That's really the message. All right. OK. Uh, now. This is such, this is this building that uh, KPF built. I know what they do up there, but it's a very you know. And what they built, they build these buildings with sky lobbies. Have you ever been in the Sears building in Chicago? We were, I was involved in that, and uh, that was one of the first buildings built with a sky lobby. It's 108 stories. And uh, it was built with a sky lobby. That means you go take, that reduces the core. What it, it reduces the core because as you have, have, you have to go way up here, you can see all these elevators. Okay? Look what you got left to rent. You don't have enough to justify this big thing that you're building here. Now, these elevators, probably these go up to maybe uh, 40 stories, and then these go up to, these are a combination, they'll go up to 60 stories, and then there are others that go up to 80 stories, and so forth. They, but uh, uh, the better way to do this is do it with a sky lobby. But uh, that's a question. Some of the tenants don't like sky, sky lobbies because they have to get up, take an elevator up to a level, and then they have to wait for another elevator to go up in a sky lobby instead of getting a new elevator and going on up. But that doesn't happen anyway. There are other people that want to get off along the way. Or you make the elevator 
go up to a certain level and then stop, which is done primarily. But uh, these are the choices. Ele you got to learn a lot about elevators because, yes, Steve. Alfred, if, you, if, if you adhere to all these principles, though, pardon? If you adhere to all these principles, and I understand it from the point yeah. of view of efficiency, wouldn't all buildings be basically square and 40 stories high? Not necessarily. We're talking about creativity in addition to all these problems. So uh, these, uh, these people want to be creative. They don't want to. They don't want to build the same tin can that everybody's built. They want to build an unusual tin can, and that's good. Creative, creative juices are what really make a designer. These people are designers, and uh, and that is that's important. It's all part of their juices to be a designer. And but on the other hand, I'm only I'm showing them the problems. So that they understand, once they design, they understand what the problems are because very often they don't, they don't understand it because they don't, no one's ever expressed it to them. Nobody's ever gone through it with them. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to enforce their knowledge so that they won't make these mistakes and that they understand that being creative is marvelous. But it not only has to be different, it has to be better have to create something that takes care of the client's need and the tenant's needs. That's what, he, that's what everybody has to keep in mind as they're doing this. That was the answer you gave us earlier, too. What? The answer to his question is what you gave us earlier is up here. Yeah, architects must always understand the trade-offs during the design process to make a fully informed decisions. That's what's important. All right? Now this, uh, We're gonna go to the next yeah, you see, uh, Sorry. Did you want to see the core size here? As you get up in this building, now some of these fall off, but generally you're not leasing enough space here to justify the building. There's no meat left on the bones. <laughs> All right, this is a shopping district over here. So. Yeah. That's the building. Here's the building. Beautiful. But does it work? Now, they work for a developer, Chinese developer, in, in, uh, uh, in, the, in Asia, who's building these buildings. He's doing well because uh, their space use is different than ours. It's changing. I mean, they need more and more space as they increase. But uh, some of these spaces up near the top of this this building can't be more than four or five thousand feet of leasable. We couldn't live with that because your the cost of the exterior, again, as I mentioned, is the same practically. You can add five feet here and five feet there. You're not adding that much, and you get much more space inside. All right.